We have a few announcements. There's a bathroom, you, you, you like go that way, then that way, and then that way. And there's a bathroom, there's also one downstairs. If you can stay seated during the teaching, then take your mask off, you know, and make sure you're socially distancing from other people so nobody feels uncomfortable. There's connection cards out in the lobby. That's Tom in the back. Tom, wave hi to everybody. Okay, everybody wave hi to Tom. All right. Give you a con, uh, con connection card if you maybe want to find out more about Calvary Chapel or Recovery Church or talk to a pastor or anything like that. You fill out one of those and we will get back to you. Uh, Recovery Church outreach every first and third Saturday. Right, Leslie? Right, Webb? <laughs> and uh, we have um, got, not us, God's doing an amazing thing. We've been giving people um, some clothes, right? Boxes of food. And we've been praying to, with people and talking about Jesus. That's, that's what they need. That's the nutrition people need. So we do that every first and third Saturday. We meet here at 4 o'clock at the church. Uh, Coffee House is back next week, next Saturday, 7 o'clock, downstairs. That's my buddy Tim and Peter and myself. And if maybe Meryl Lee might join us. But we have a, a little group called the Friends of the Rev. And uh, we're going to be there next Saturday. There's an AA meeting here on Friday night, James Gang. The name comes out of the book of James in the Bible, and that's Friday night, 7.30 to 8.30. They're meeting right here face-to-face -face and talking about a solution. I think that's what we need. We need a solution, and Jesus is a great solution. There's a woman's recovery 12-step meeting on Wednesday night here from 7 to 8, face-to-face, -face, and there's a solution. And on Fourth Sunday, we do uh, we call it, they say recovery crosses, but they're really freedom crosses where people have um, you know they've 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 surrendered their lives to the Lord and they're walking with the Lord and 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 they're they've been freed and so we give them a little uh, colored cross to kind of commemorate their walk time with the Lord. So welcome to Calvary Chapel. We want to exalt the Savior, edify the believer and evangelize the sinner. So I'm like real old, and I can't remember if I prayed or not, so I'm going to pray again even if I didn't. So, Lord, thank you for this evening. Oh, I think I did, but I, you know what? Paul said pray without ceasing. So, Lord, thank you. It's a privilege to uh, serve. You prayed that uh, hard hearts will hear. Put us all behind the cross that they not see nor hear us, but see, know, and hear you, Lord. And we thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. No, I said pray without ceasing, not play without ceasing. So you probably haven't heard any of these songs because these are songs that God gave me. And I, I don't know, the Lord just said, play the stuff you're going to play uh, Saturday night so that way people can figure if they want to come or not. No, I'm kidding.
Make a choice, cause it's all up to you. You can receive this gift that God has made for you. God has a plan for you. You know what? I want to tell you something. Recovery is possible. Life is, poss is so possible. And God is so good. My little friend knows that, right? God is good. Where is she? There she is. And um, you know what? You don't have to suffer. Just ask God for some help. And if you don't know how to do this, our friends Bob and Leslie will be up front after the teaching when we do the last song and they'll pray with you.
Give God a hand clap. Can you imagine? You know, we can go into a sport, and this is, I'm not anti-sports. I don't want anybody to think I'm like that. But we can go to an event or you could go to a music concert, and everybody's like freaking out. Why can't we do that with God? I don't know about you, but I know where he pulled me out of. It wasn't good. I mean, you can even get up and move a little bit. (laughs) See, I'm old. I have to remember... Hey, is it okay if we're playing a little livelier stuff? Okay, I'm just asking. Because if it's not, you got to take it up with God because I think the Holy Spirit told me to.
Hello? Can you hear me now? Sai? Bieni too? Good. Not bad, huh? So we're going to talk about the 10th step, but I want to tell you something really, really important. In case you don't believe it or you haven't heard it, that whatever you're struggling with, God has, has a plan for you in your life. You know, we were doing that last song, and we sung about once I was homeless and I was addicted to. You know who that song was talking about? Me. That's, that's my message, that God came into my life and changed my life. Hopelessly addicted, no hope for nothing, and God was like, nah, don't buy into the lie. You don't have to buy into the lie anymore. We're, we're going to talk about the tenth step. I want to pray first. That looks different. Oh, there it is. Okay, so Lord, put me, put me behind the cross that they not see, know, or hear me, but only see, know, and hear you, Lord. You have a plan. You have a plan for people, everyone. No one's exempt, Lord. And um, Lord, it seems like for so many people I know at, at our lowest moment, Jesus, you just came into our life. And uh, when, you're, when you're in that low bottom, there's only one place, and that's up, and you picked us up, and you, uh, you put us on fertile soil in our lives, and so we're just so grateful, Lord, for what you're doing in the lives of everybody, God. We pray for, I want to lift up this community, God. I want to pray for peace in the community, God. But for people to find peace, they need to know the Prince of Peace, and that's my prayer, Lord. You know? Sometimes we get so caught up in politics and government and everything, and you know what, Jesus, you've been telling us the same thing. You know, you've told us, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You've been trying to get people to rest in you and abide in you, Lord. And that's the word you've uh, laid on my heart for tonight, to talk about abiding in you, Lord. And, you, and you're just so good, Lord. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're new to Recovery Church, welcome. If you're coming back again, welcome. And it's good to see everyone here. The tenth step says, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. See, if I don't look at myself, I can go through life thinking that I'm really good and I don't have any problems. My wife doesn't need to add to that. No, I'm kidding. But no, seriously, you know. And the beauty of it is, is it, I believe it's a big time principle. Because God wants us to be connected with each other, amen? Amen. He wants, he wants us not walking around holding a grudge against somebody. So we look at ourselves, and when there's something wrong, promptly admit it. I know this to be true. Sometimes when we step out, and we don't sit there and say, yeah, but they were worse than us. But we trust God, and we start to step out in faith with him, 
And we go to that person, and it's amazing how that person might, by the end of the conversation, say, you know what, I was wrong too. But see, nothing happens, thank you, Lord, unless it's initiated in this world. Nothing happens unless it's initiated. Your faith is because Jesus initiated with you and with me. God initiated with us. And so we need to initiate things, but there are things that are good. Can you go back to that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. This is the verse that Celebrate Recovery ties it in. It says, if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you do that you don't fall, you do not fall. See, there's this three-letter thing called EPA, and it's not a government facility. It's ego, pride, and arrogance. And we talk about when we're doing the restitution and we're righting our wrongs and we're going to people, we can't go there with our ego or pride and our arrogance. We need to go there with, with the humility that Christ had, you know? on the cross you know he could have called angels legions of angels down but god has a plan for us he has a good plan so this corinthians paul writes that if you think you're standing firm be careful that you don't fall see if we start thinking like we're all that and that's what paul's talking about we're never willing to look inside of us if i want to find a problem in my life i just go to the mirror that's what i do I look at me. So, can I tell a joke in church? Thank you. So this teenage girl brought her new boyfriend home to meet her parents. Remember that, Mark? <laughs> and they were appalled by his leather jacket, motorcycle boots, tattoos, and pierced nose. Yeah, you're going to hear a biker joke from me. I don't know why. And later the parents pulled their daughter aside and confessed their concerned dear the mother said he doesn't seem nice oh please mom the daughter replied if he wasn't so nice why would he be doing 200 hours of community service it's okay to laugh come on don't tell me that didn't feel good to laugh in church how many, how many people went to church and you were just like, you were worried that, you know, when you were a kid, the old man was going to go, whack, you know, because I said something or I didn't kneel when I needed to or sit when I needed to or stand when I needed to or my tie wasn't right and it's like, oh man, you know, that's the freedom of a relationship with Jesus. I don't know where everyone here is. I, I have some friends and I kind of know where they're at, but I don't know where you're at, but I'm going to tell you what, there's such a freedom in Christ. There's such a freedom. And we don't laugh to, to, to go against God or, or anything like that. But sometimes, you know, laughter is a good way of getting something out inside of us, you know, that we don't want to let go. I want to talk tonight, though, about maintaining faith in recovery or a faith walk. Victor Emmanuel Rivera said this, more important than starting well in our walk with our walk with God, it's better to finish well. Mike Caruso told me years ago, he said, John, look at your, your walk with Jesus like a track and field event. Don't be a sprinter. Be a marathon runner. Pace yourself. See, when we pace ourselves, we're not going so fast that we can't talk to the Lord. We can't commune with God. You know, Paul said, pray without ceasing. We hear, we hear about this word called maintenance in our recovery. And that's where maintenance can help us so that we're, we're a marathoner, not a sprinter. You know, we, I heard early on in recovery that meeting makers make it. I see people... You know, my life has changed, and I see people that are going, that go to church, you know, and they love the Lord, and, they, and you can see God's love in their heart. They have a peace beyond all understanding. Because I don't know about you guys, but in my days of active addiction, a peace beyond 
you know, my understanding was something that everybody else had because I didn't deserve it, you know, and that was the lies that the enemy placed to me. So in recovery, it's important to, be, to have maintenance. The tenth step is about maintenance, and it helps us. So what, what do we do? We do things collectively together. The Bible tells us that when two or more are gathered in his name, he's there in the midst. That when we come together as one in Christ, we're getting strengthened. I don't know about you, but you guys strengthen me. You guys strengthen me. You guys show me that this is possible and I can keep going. That there's people out there that care about me. Because the old voice told me I was worthless. I would never amount to anything. Because once I was homeless and I was addicted to, and then he came and he loved me, and showed me the truth. That's the words of that song. That's what God did in my life. And if you don't hear anything else out of from me tonight, hear this, that he has the same offer for you. If you've never received it, he has the same offer for you. So how do we get, how do we get our most bang for the buck in our relationship with the Lord? You know what? It starts with knowing the Lord. That's where it starts having a relationship with them. That's where the maintenance comes in. We, we spend time with them, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to spend time in prayer. John 15, 7, as a matter of fact, if somebody could grab some Bibles as I'm going here, um, if you want to follow along. We're going to be in John f chapter 15 tonight, but I've got some other verses. On it. But this one, it talks about prayer. Jesus said this, if you remain in me, notice the word he says, remaining in him. It doesn't mean, you know, today I'm with Jesus and tomorrow I'm going to be here and then I'm going to, he says to remain in him. He says, remain in me and my words, and my words remains in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. See, we start to spend time with him and you know what changed in my life but the more I spent time with God? The things that I ask God for. The motives change. You know? He gave me a new life, and I just felt so fortunate. It was like, you know what? I started to realize that people told me that God will meet all your needs. And you know what happened? That I wasn't asking them for the things I used to ask them for. I tell people all the time, I used to have cocaine prayers. God, can you hook a brother up, you know? Two, two, three, and four in the morning. Anybody ever been there? Maybe a little later, you know? Or, hey, God, can you shoot those birds that are squawking at five in the morning outside my window? I've been up all night. Come on, God, I had a really tough night. Can you help me out? But the thing about it is, is that we start to change because God starts to change us. The second way that you can grow closer to God and know him is reading his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says all Scripture is God-breathed. God breathes His Word out. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. You see, it's not something that we just, we, we get hold of this Bible and we put it on our shelf and it gets dust. His Word has such a purpose. His Word changes us. And the third thing, to, I believe, to grow closer to God is the fellowship with like-minded believers and people that, that, that are on the same path you are. And as I said before, that scripture, when two or more are gathered in his name, you know, we, uh, we go down to, uh, to um, State Street. I got to tell you, I'm like a little kid. I have the best time, <laughs> don't we? It's just, man, it's just innocent, and it's organic, and it's just what Jesus wanted us to do, you know? He sets the appointments. We need to understand that. But see, if we're not fellowshipping with others, that we're going to have good, godly conversation, we're not reading the Word, we're not praying, we don't start to gain this wisdom that we need. We're maybe... You might be at that point right now where anytime anything comes up, you're ready to, th I've been there, ready to throw the towel in, call it quits. But what happens is God starts to change 
our thinking as it talks about in Romans chapter 12 that we're not no longer conformed to the world but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind and we start to think differently and at one time it was always put my Nikes and run today it's I better start praying to the Lord you know because he because he doesn't leave me nor forsake me you know In Proverbs chapter 18, uh, 8, verse 17, it says, the Lord speaking says, I love those who love me. And watch this. Maybe you're saying to yourself, and I love this scripture because it kind of answers the question. You may be saying, yeah, I tried, I tried to find God and I couldn't. And, and the scripture answers that. He says, I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently. It doesn't mean try it for a minute and give up. Be about it. Chase him. Pursue him. He says, they did that, that seek me diligently, they find me. And how do we do that? By loving him, by seeking him, and we will find him. Because he loves you. You know, and we get evidence in our life. God starts to change our life. And there's fruit in our life. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. It doesn't say, you know, grow. You know what? Back in the day, I wanted to know everything about what I was doing. Now I have this new walk with Jesus. I need to find out what's going on. Because you know when it was on on the street, you knew where to go. Anybody ever been there? Come on, let's get honest here. You know, we needed to have all that knowledge. And what this knowledge, the knowledge of God does, is we get a better understanding of who He is, how much He loves us, what He wants to do in our life. And we start to grow, we start to mature. We don't get so worked up. And our maintenance and our recovery, it just, it becomes smoother and it becomes good. In, in 2 Peter 3.18, there's a couple of things I notice. The first thing, it says that we grow in grace. Growing in grace is allowing the, the Lord to work upon the heart, which then reflects the life. See, when we take a risk and we, we ask the Lord, Lord, work on my heart, you're going to change. You will change. You may be a little bit freaked out because all of a sudden maybe where you weren't, didn't want to be nice to anybody, all of a sudden you might even start opening up the door for somebody or saying good morning to somebody. And you'll start to notice it. But then after a while it becomes almost like an addiction because I want more of what God wants to give me. The second growth I saw there comes from when we seek the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, when we're seeking Him in our life. And what happens from that? We change and we give the glory to God because He's do it. Let's turn, yeah, let's turn to, sorry, Sean, I'm not going to use all those... <laughs> Yeah, let's turn to John chapter 15. I love this. I, I love this scripture because this is, we're talking about maintenance. <sighs> no, the gospel of John. Fourth book of the gospels. John chapter 15 starting at verse 1. I love the way that Jesus breaks this all down because there's such a, a recovery principle. Did you ever notice in your life that the place that you hang out or who you hang around has a reflection on your life? That's the, re that's the, that's the importance of abiding in Christ. You know? Hang with Jesus. He'll rub off on you. He will. He will. That's the importance of this. That's what Jesus is saying. 
Who you spend time with is what you will become. You know? I look back in my life. Every time I spent my life with people that were just like me, I never changed. Thank you, Lord. I never changed because I was just hanging with myself. And then God put some people in my life, you know. And what was, what was really cool about it all, I started, it wasn't, I wasn't jealous. It's just I wanted to be a little bit more like them and a little bit less than me, you know. A long time ago, you know, God put some godly men in my life. And one of the things that really drew me to these people, and some of them are still in my life now, is the way that they treated their wives. Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I got the ring. I got the ring. <laughs> I love my wife. She's right back there. But, you know, we come out of the battle, and we don't know how to maintain our lives maybe sometimes. Some people, they've been living, you know, a normal life, and everything's good. And, and praise God for that. I'm not putting that down. But I want to tell you, get some people, you know, get a posse together that are following the one that laid down their life for you. Get with people that are going to invest in your life. And you know why they're going to invest in your life? Because God invested in their life. Because that maybe at a point in their life, they were just where you are right now. They were broken down, hurting. There was no hope for anything. And God sent somebody in their life. You know? Look at Jesus. <laughs> he, went down, he went down and grabbed four fishermen. <laughs> you know? And, and, and then others, a tax collector. You know? I think Jesus had the original recovery church, to be honest with you. You know, but you know what? The people that nobody wanted anything to do with. And if we really look at it, maybe that's been us. Maybe we can look back at our life and say, you know what? I've been that person. But let's see what the Lord says in his word in, in John chapter 15. Where's my buddy Webb? Yeah. <laughs> First uh, 10. Yeah. No, 1 through 10, verse 10. I am, the true, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Thank you. So in the NIV, uses the word remain, not abide, but, but it's the same point. I like, I like the word re, remain, too. It means to stay, not run away. And, that's, and, and, and we're, if we're going through this life walk... You know, you're going to cling to something. You know, it's like a, the world is like Star Trek, you know. Everybody's a cling on to something, you know. We cling on to things. We grab hold of it, you know. 
And the great thing is when Jesus gets hold of us and we grab onto him and we remain in him or abide in him, our life changes. You know, one of the scariest things for me in recovery when I was new to recovery was my life started changing and there was all this weird stuff and I started feeling feelings and there was all this emotional turmoil in my life. And that's the time, maybe you're there right now, that's the time to, to, to have a good prayer life and spend time with the Lord. As it talks in here in, in, the, in the first couple verses, Jesus says he identifies himself as the true vine. And my father is the gardener. In other words, there's a position that's set there, but it's relational to us. We need to look at it. If I've got farmers in the front row, so I better get this right. But, <laughs> but if we look at it, he's the vine, we're the branches. Our nutrition, spiritual nutrition, comes from the vine, and it comes up to us. You know? The Father, what He wants to do, He wants to prune our lives. And that's okay. When I first got clean and sober and I got into recovery, I didn't want to get pruned. That's, that, there's, it hurts. But see, God knows what's best for us, and that was something that I didn't realize. Came into things that I thought I was the man. And I found out I wasn't. But it goes on and says, the Father cuts away every branch in it that bears no fruit, while every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. In our recovery, what happens if you would allow six and seven step, you know, become entirely ready, and then ask, humbly ask him to remove those shortcomings, our sins, out of our life, what he's doing is he's going to, it's, it's like pruning. He takes those things away. And then what happens is, as it says here in the Word, there's more fruit. See, what happens is if you would allow God to do the things that God wants to do in your life, you're going to become a billboard for Jesus Christ. You will become a billboard. People will start to look at you Probably the first few times they're going to go, is that John Powell? They might listen to you talk and they'll go, they might go to, of course, they're not probably going to ask you. They'll go to one of your friends and they'll go, what happened to him? You know, I had a Jesus encounter. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. He did it. I didn't. But along the way, I found out that being faithful with God gave me less bumps on my head. You know? That, that bumper sticker they have, you know, about the, the two-by-four that God uses to get our attention. You know? But we start to have this relationship with Him. And He prunes us. And He changes us. I want to tell you right now, don't try and do things in life all by yourself. Not good. I was talking to somebody today, and they, they were like, ah, you know, I just like to go away and just be in a, a cabin by myself. And I said, yeah, but that's a recipe for isolation. And you know what the devil likes? He likes you to isolate. To get by yourself so they can get further and further in your head. You know, we, we see people struggling with life. We see people, you know, they, 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 they're, they're in recovery, then they get out or they're going to church, and, and, and it's the usual things, you know. You know, they don't like me. People at church don't like me. The church wants my money. I don't sit here and ask, I don't pass a bat. We don't pass a basket here. I don't ask people for that, you know. God provides. That's what happens. There's no secret agenda. You know, God wants to see people to people to, to, to fulfill to what God wants you to do. He's got a plan and a purpose. But along the way, what happens is we come in, into this new life and we got some stuff that God's got to get off of us. It's like it's an analogy of pruning or, or weeding a garden, get, getting the weeds away. 
And then in verse 3 it says, you are all, watch what he says though, you are already clean because of the word. See, that's what washes us. We get washed by the word of God. It cleanses us. It starts to, we start to read it and we start to get a better understanding and, the, and you know what? And our, our minds get cleaned up too along the way. And somebody said a long time ago that Christians are brainwashed. Well, I want to tell you for the record, <laughs> when I got serious about walking, walking with Jesus, I needed a good brainwashing. My mind was terrible. But it says here, it says, you're already clean because of the Word. Jesus is telling them why. What's changed them? Besides him, for him, of course, first and foremost, but it's the washing of the word. They have the word in them now. The word I have spoken to you. And then verse 4 says, remain in me. There's that abide, remain word. How do you, how do you stay along on the path when everything's going along and, and, and we're getting bombarded? I mean, how, did you, how was your day today? Did you have a bad moment? Anybody ever had a perfect life? I'm not putting my hands up. You know, how do you get through that? John chapter 15. We remain in him. He says, remain in me as, as I also remain in you. See, we start, for me, I start to look at it. It's a partnership that I have with the Lord. He's the Lord and I'm me. But as I remain in him, he remains in me as I draw to him he draws to me and it's that personal relationship I think that's why some people struggle with that whole piece see it isn't like you got to jump through hoops or anything like that Jesus wants to be in your life and you will never look back you know and say that wasn't worth it if you're seriously pursuing him and chasing him and abiding in him, having him lead your life, you know, we don't have to go back unless we want to. And the great thing now is the Lord's in the center of our life and we don't have to go back. That's the lie. I was thinking about that today. Here's, here's one of the lies I heard. You're always going to be a drug addict, John. Anybody ever been there? You know, you're never going to amount to nothing. You're dumb. And you know what? I bought into that for a long time. And then God gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. And I'd never trade what I have today. But the things that I have today, and I want to tell you this, are not what I've done. It's what God has, has, has blessed me with and he's put in my life. And one of the most incredible things that God has given me is everybody in this room right now. You know? But it starts with what? Remaining in Him. See, I don't know about anybody else, and, and, and sometimes it's, it's tough teaching the Word of God because you've got to, like, reveal yourself. But I want to tell you, I got into recovery in uh, 1981, and I'd like to say that since then I've been good, but no. Then in 88, I got back into recovery, and, and, my, and I, I got back into my faith and my walk with the Lord after that, and it changed my life, you know? And you may be struggling, and you might say, well, you know, I can't do this. Let me ask you a question then. Where is Jesus in your life? See, when I try to do things on my own back in the early 80s, I look back at my life, and, and it was me driving the bus. thought I was in charge. I was the man. Oh, if you knew who I was, you know, in 1988, I walked into a treatment center, 137 pounds. I was pretty buff, you know. And, but you know what? I was walking on my plan. I was abiding in me, and I wasn't abiding in him. So he tells us in verse 4, to remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit 
unless you remain in me. It's the maintenance that we do. We trust him. We trust him with our life. And he changes it. Because I want to tell you, whatever you came out of that day when you surrendered and came here or a meeting or anything, or your life, or maybe you were at a point in your life and you, and, you, and you asked Jesus into your heart and you've been going to church, all that misery that, that you left, it's still out there. You know, we've been, this community just went through a thing. A teenage boy was, was shot and killed. It's all out there. But see, thank you, Lord, when we're remaining in him, we're not out there. That has to do with the point I was making before that the people that you surround yourself with are going to impact you. And I, I mean, I got friends I play music with and friends I'm on the street with and friends I, I know from we're all doing ministry together. And that's all because I choose to abide in Christ. You know? Look at the blessings. Maybe there was a time, maybe you're struggling now, and maybe there was a time where you were abiding in Him. I want you to think back for a minute of how good that was. And then try to figure out where you veered off a little bit. What happened? Relationship? Or a bad day? Or maybe it was a good day. But we make a choice. But see, when we're focused on abiding in Him, He's producing fruit in us. There's a change. We become of service. God can use us, and our lives change. And then he, he says this. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But he says this, apart from me, you, cannot, you can do nothing. See, because what happens when we're apart from him, like I said before, we're driving the bus again. And then verse 6 says, and if you do not remain in me, you're, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withered. See, it's something that doesn't have any value. It says it withered. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. There's an eternal principle to what Jesus is saying right here. Verse 7, if you, if you remain in me and my word remains in you. So he, he's telling us something that's really good. Not only remain in him, but have his word remain in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And it's like I was saying before, because, you know, I believe our motives start to change, the things we ask for start to change, and we're starting to be real with God. And that's a good place to be. And verse 8, 8, 9, and 10 says, This is my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. When we go out, I saw, I saw you talking to some people last night, and it's just so good because God gets glorified in it, you know? We, we, we touch the life of a person, or, we, or we're there, and, and you know what? And that's so far from our nature. I don't know about you, but I used to be very self-centered, and I have to watch that. That's why I need to abide in him. He says that it's his Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. And as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus wants to love on you. Now remain in my love, and if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Hey, the, the, Peter and Tim and Marilee, you want to come up here? I just want to talk to you for a quick second, and then, um, yeah. The thing about it is, is that life, life is a choice. And I, and I, and I want to I wanna close out this with this. You have a choice tonight, Bob and Leslie, you want to? See these really nice people here? <laughs> They're my buds. Maybe there's a question in your mind. Maybe you've where you don't, you're like, okay, you say become born again, come up and ask them. They'll pray with you. Maybe you've, you've been out there 
And for some reason, you don't know why, but you're at Recovery Church tonight. But you don't know why. And I like to say I really believe that God has his hand in the plan. And maybe you've moved away from God, and maybe it's time you could come up tonight and you can receive some prayer. Maybe you're hurting. Maybe your health is bad. Maybe there's something going on in your life. And you don't have to tell someone. You can ask them, would you just pray for me because there's something happening? Maybe, uh, maybe you want to you you know, get tighter in your recovery. There's nothing wrong with someone interceding and praying with you. And maybe tonight's the night of your salvation. Woo-hoo! You know? That might be a really great reason to come up and get some prayer. We're going to do one more song, and as we do, you feel free to come on up, and uh, they'll pray with you. And uh, so, Lord, thank you for uh, your word, Lord. Thank you for this night, God. Thank you for everyone that's here. And I pray, Lord, that if people are on the fence about you, God, that they wouldn't leave here without seeking prayer and seeking you, Lord. And maybe tonight's the night for one, two, or three to come up and ask Jesus into their heart, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Dios.